So I'd like to give a huge thank you to our sponsor, Stavi, who has been a great partner throughout this um, and has put together this amazing event for you. So um, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Anne to kick us off. Thanks, Anna. Um, hi, I'm Anne Nguyen. Um, so a little bit more about Stavi before we start talking to our panelists. Uh, we're a secure SaaS platform. Uh, we help real estate uh, professionals, banks, law firms, and customers collaborate and complete transactions. It's sort of like a marriage between Zoom, which we're on now, and a digital signing platform, um, DocuSign, something like DocuSign, um, and with remote notarization. So it's it's like uh, like a marriage between some really inter interesting technologies. Uh, if you're interested, uh, we have like a React type script uh, front end and our back end is Python um, with some services in Java. Um, so again, um, my name is Anne uh, and I will be your moderator today. Um, uh, it's interesting that we're talking about uh, mid-career decisions because I'm in my third career right now. I went from marketing to education. Now I'm a, a software engineer and I hope hopefully I will be retiring um, as a software engineer as well. Um, so uh, Anna, if we could move to the next slide, please. Uh, with our panelists here. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, navigating mid-career decisions. Uh, it includes things to think, think about when you're in your current mid your, your current role now, um, as well as your your role in in your career as a whole. Um, and they'll also be sharing ideas on and strategies to to move to the next level. So um, I have my five panelists here. They're they're from different areas of savvy. Um, so you're going to be able to get different perspectives. Um, to in, in, in case you have different uh, if you have questions about different areas um, that you're interested in. So, so panelists, um, if you could just give us a history of how you got started and what your journey here was like to where you are now. I'm going to start with Alex, um, who is our product manager at Savvy. Hi, thanks, Dan. Super excited to uh, be a part of this today. So I just want to give a quick shout out. I saw in the chat uh, we had Kyla say, as a kid, I wanted to be a bridge builder. Uh, I think that's pretty awesome. So uh, I see myself as a product manager, as a build, <laughs> as a bridge builder. Um, so let's dive in a little bit how I got here. So my path has been long and windy and nonlinear. Uh, I graduated with a BA in English and World Literature. I'm a first generation American. So I did not have a lot of support navigating pre pre-college life and post-college life. I was in the arts, uh, working in the service industry while I was also in a non-for-profit theater company and living in a shoebox in Brooklyn. Uh, I found myself spending most of my time uh, grabbing shifts and trying to make ends meet, and I had no idea what to do. Uh, my brother was a software engineer and, well, still is, and he encouraged me to go into tech, but I never saw myself being there. I didn't understand what opportunities existed. Uh, and eventually I gave in and I applied to Toast uh, as a QA person, so quality assurance engineer. I worked at Toast for about three months into QA before the pandemic hit. Then the pandemic hit and the company laid off half of its workforce, which was about 1500 employees. They circul circulated a list of us. Um, that got into the hands of uh, one of Stavi's founders, and I interviewed and got a position in QA. Once in QA, I realized I wasn't feeling stimulated enough and started to explore options within, within the company, and I picked up product while still doing QA and eventually landed myself a product role. So that's, that's how I got here. Thanks, Alex. Um, that's definitely a windy road. Uh, and we also have Ali, who is our staff software engineer. Um, Ali, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, um, mine was not not quite as windy as that. Um, I actually originally wanted to be an architect. That was like the first career that I ever was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then I realized how much math was involved in that. And that was kind of a no go. Um, so I ended up actually going to college for graphic design, um, and art and graduated with a BFA. Um, when I started, um, I was, um, my first job as a professional, or sorry, I started my professional career as a web designer. Um, I learned like basic HTML and CSS in college, um, and then kind of on my own time afterwards, um, especially at that job, I started teaching myself some like really basic JavaScript, just kind of on the side. 
Um, and then uh, I kind of became a developer by happy accident. Someone referred me for a job. Wasn't sure if it was web design or web development. Um, and seeing as I had some very basic um, development skills, I decided to go for it anyways. And it did turn out to be development. So I started my dev career building just basic interactive landing pages and emails um, at Staples, which I hope most people have heard of. Um, <laughs> um, and anyways, um, I taught myself jQuery and basic JavaScript also in there, like just continued that and started reaching out to other teams in an effort to try and reduce the amount of boilerplate I found myself using. Um, like every landing page was largely the same, but there wasn't really a good place to kind of make things reusable. Um, and that started to kind of bother me. So I started to make more connections um, in an effort to try and make that easier and to make a slightly more integrated customer experience. Um, and that process kind of helped me land on a new team that was rebuilding our e-commerce site um, using kind of the latest and greatest SBA tech, which at the time was Angular 2, brand new. Um, and that kind of launched me into the world of modern web-based software development. Um, so I've been running down that road ever since, going from jQuery to Angular and for the last several years, React. Um, I landed at Savvy. Um, like Alex, I was also at Toast and got laid off, um, which was, you know, a jarring experience, but also was kind of a, a moment for me where I realized I actually felt like I had a good grasp on what I was doing and it wasn't quite as panicky to like try and find a new job just because I had a level of confidence in my relatively new field still um, to to kind of find a, a seat at that table. So um, that landed me at Savvy um, and it has been a whirlwind ever since then. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks, Ali. So next we have Kate, who is um, our site reliability and uh, security engineer, multi-talented. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, so, so yeah, I do uh, site reliability and security at Stavi right now. Um, I also had a pretty windy road going into tech. Uh, about six years ago, I went with my now husband to uh, the security conference uh, called DEF CON. Uh, folks in the security industry are probably pretty familiar with it, uh, with no context as to what I was walking into, just was sort of part of a bigger trip we had planned and and uh, was uh, left inspired to want to join the tech industry. Um, I didn't have a degree, so I, I sort of assumed that was not a door that was open until I went to DEF CON and I was like, oh, this is awesome and I can self-teach and I can get there. Uh, so I uh, and ended up starting in a sort of support type role uh, and pivoted into QA, uh, worked in QA for uh, a couple of years, uh, two different companies, um, also part of the Toast layoffs, uh, but that was also uh, really for the better um, and ended up getting hired at my com current company uh, as an SRE and I sort of pivoted into the, the security space. Um, so took about five years to get there, but uh, ended up in security, which is what what is most interesting to me. That's awesome. Thanks, Kate. Um, so now we're moving away from our Toast alums. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to uh, talk to Kaylee, who's our engineering manager of the platform team. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. I'm wowed by the percent for per participation numbers in the lower left here. Um, oh, my God. So uh, my background, um, let me know if you've heard this already, even in this panel, but I come from a non-traditional background where I went to college and left with a bachelor in creative writing, mostly because it's the first class I took that I could felt like I could enjoy for four years. And I figured I would figure out my career later. So when I left, um, I had a friend working for a more social justice oriented company and I went into sales thinking, you know, my background in waitressing all through high school and college would get me somewhere. And I learned very quickly, I hated sales. So, but what I liked was I looked for the inefficiencies in the, in the organization. And that could be a human process inefficiency or a systems inefficiency or a lack of tooling. And I would go after the things that I thought would have the biggest value for whatever problem space I was staring at. So four years later, uh, I moved from sales and made my own role in marketing where I had set up a whole bunch of email triggers, et cetera, that just didn't literally didn't exist before. And I had this crossroads with myself. Of, I could continue this path of carving out things that felt good and instinctual to me without anyone to learn from and without a real career ladder to shoot for, or I could take a huge risk and do something different. Um, so I had a friend, and this is where a little bit of lock and risk comes into play, but I had a friend working for an e-commerce company 
doing a major replatforming and their strategy, which is not advised, is to just throw bodies at it to make it go faster. Um, but I was one of those bodies. And so I took a risk on myself to leave a salaried position, good benefits uh, at the time, uh, a month of paid time off, which unlimited was unheard of at the time, uh, to a hourly, no health insurance, no benefits, and a three-month commitment of working as a QA engineer. I took the leap. I loved it. And within that three-month period, I was hired full-time. I ended up staying in that company for nine years, which is also sort of unheard of within the tech space. Um, but for me, it felt like a new job every few years. I was being fed new opportunities. And eventually, I was right place, right time to be someone that could take over a role of managing a team and actually being a team lead. So I took the, the lateral shift from being an individual IC for QA into team leadership and, and eventually engineering man, manager position. Um, and also have loved that too. So uh, I've joined Stabby somewhat recently at this role. Um, but yeah, that's that's me in a quick nutshell. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, so finally, we have our another software engineer who specializes in the back end, um, Morgan. Would you like to introduce yourself and give us a history? Yeah, thanks, Ann. Hello, everybody. Um, so my journey with tech uh, originally started when I took a couple of, of programming classes in high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I totally fell in love with it. Uh, so after that, I, I took a, a pretty traditional path. Uh, I did a, a four year bachelor's program in, in computer science, um, which ultimately ended up taking me a little bit closer to six years. Um, since then, I've I've always worked in in small companies, so I've I've gotten the opportunity to um, wear a lot of different hats and and get a lot of uh, exposure to sort of different layers and and functions of the business. Working with customers, you know, working with um, other teams, and uh, you know, sort of at, at all layers of of the process. Uh, I've, I even did a a stint in in management, recycling a managing a recycling plant for for a period of time. Um, all of which was very valuable experience, though definitely confirmed my my love for software development um, and my sort of desire to continue to be an individual contributor. So, um, Savvy is actually the biggest company that I've I've worked for so far, uh, by far. Um, I think we're at about 150 headcount. Um, so yeah, I've I've been with Savvy for about a about a year now, working on the back end, having a good time. Um, so Morgan's also working on a really cool feature, um, auto tagging. You guys don't know anything about it, but I think it's really cool. Uh, so super excited uh, to have Morgan with us. Um, so before we dive into like uh, audience questions, I do have a few questions for our panelists, um, which I think will help uh, provide some insight into uh, their journey along the way. Um, so. This, this first question is, can you share any challenges you faced along the way and how you overcame them to, to get to your current role? Um, we, we could start with Kate in this one. Sure. Uh, one, one really pivotal one comes to mind. It was very early in my career as QA. Um, I was maybe three or four months in, still kind of getting my bearings and understanding what that role looked like uh, and in uh, figuring out how to navigate being in tech. It's always a little bit of a different language. It's different. Uh, it's, it has its own sort of cadence. Uh, and they were looking to, uh, for me to test a feature. And when I went to test it, I realized, uh, only half of the feature worked. Um, it was, a, it was a pretty bad user experience. Um, cause basically you clicked on something you expected X, X did not happen half of the time. Uh, and, it was so so I, I dug my heels in and I I you know I raised 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 the alarm and and you know had a bunch of meetings and uh I don't I don't regret doing that um but at a certain point there was a point when I should have let it go and I didn't um and uh there there was um I mean and the funny part was they ended up fixing it six months later <laughs> uh because I think there was a lot of customers who who thought similarly but um uh, learning when to, it, it was a challenge early in my career. Um, I always get really want to do the right thing. Um, and, and while that is good, I, I, I think I dug my heels in too much. So learning, learning when to 
say, okay, I'm going to find and report and move on versus when to dig your heels in. Um, it's hard. And it's always a judgment call. Um, but there's times to, to push and there's times to not. Um, and uh, kind of learning that balance was uh, definitely a challenge early in my career. Yeah, definitely. Um, sometimes you have to know when to stop for sure. Um, okay, so the next person I have is Allie. Um, can you share some challenges along the way? Sure. Um, so I I did have some level of support in my first two dev roles. Um, I guess three. Um, I kind of moved at one point uh, within my first company, um, just from like the static landing pages into software engineering land, um, a little more so. Um, but yeah, so the the mentorship that I got was a little bit limited by like the team size I have, and then my mentors just having other priorities. Um, my first team um, was really a marketing team. It was not an engineering org and everyone was just kind of like, just figure it out. Um, so that, that wasn't necessarily easy. Um, my second role there definitely had a little bit more help, um, but it was tough because these were people that were also, you know, fighting with other priorities within the business. Um, time was just limited. It was like a team of like five people and we're all trying to do a lot. So it, it was definitely tough there. I spent a lot of time trying to figure stuff out on my own the hard way. So the plus side, um, like, you know, most lessons you learn the hard way is that the things that I have learned have stuck with me a lot. Uh, I've gotten much better at figuring things out without quite as much banging my head against the wall. Um, so that's a useful skill. Gotten really good at Googling too, which is also a skill. <laughs> um, to overcome some of that, um, I started making myself just a lot more visible. Any place that had something that I wanted to learn um, or that I cared about and being like as curious as possible about how to do something or how to improve something. Um, that led to, you know, if nothing else, a lot of like connections even within the company um, and, and moving around a little bit. And it, it does take time, but for me, like that's led me to some really good conversations, some really good learnings. Um, and it's, it's usually coming from people who want to see that kind of curiosity uh, and want to nurture it. So being, being as visible as you can and just expressing that curiosity is huge. Yep, yeah, definitely. Um, so just just to plug out uh, about Stabby, um, Ali's sort of our our, our front end leader, right? As I view it, and and Ali's definitely been very instrumental in like making sure we're not siloed in our own little world um, as as a front end team. So definitely big props to Ali there, um, and that interesting to hear that she got that from her own le learnings and then passing it along to us. Um, so the last person I'll ask this question to in regards to challenges you faced along the way is Kaylee. Um, yeah, so ditto to both of, I think, the examples um, both Kate and Allie brought up. But for me, um, I'll go a little bit broader and say I think imposter syndrome can get the best of everybody, especially if you've changed a career uh, into tech later than in post-college, and especially if you done a lateral move in from let's say QA into engineering and then even just IC into management you have all these moments where you go from knowing something really well being an expert in your space to suddenly feeling really out of your depth um and how I have learned to cope with that is to first definitely recognize that those feelings are real and totally valid and I think also to say that sometimes we are our own worst enemies and we unintentionally limit ourselves by what this idea of what we think we're capable of. Um, and in those scenarios, I think it's really beneficial to build a group of people around you who can be your mirror and you look to them instead and have them tell you what they think that you are capable of because they're actually probably have a better view of it than you do. Um, and where that kind of comes into play more crisply in, in my journey is that um, when I made that shift from QA IC to team lead, um, I was in a room with a bunch of directors discussing a reorg for our development teams. And it's crazy to think that I was in there, but I was in there because I was so opinionated and I had such a good view on how the teams were working and what folks were capable of and, and what the relationships were that um, it seemed natural for them to invite me. And then when the moment came up to say, okay, we want to spin up this new team, um, this previous team you left, who's going to do it? Are we going to hire like pull up from internally? Or are we going to hire from external sources? And someone threw my name out and it wasn't me, right? Like I would have been glad to pull, help, you know, be like, hey, what about me? But I, I wasn't thinking about myself in that way, but someone else was. So um, yeah, just that is a challenge. There have been many challenges 
rest right. assured. And there'll be many more, right? That's kind of the fun of being in tech. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a great story. Um, definitely a good part of being at the right place at the right time and sort of making your own luck. Um, okay, so sort of in a similar question, um, which is, uh, what is something that surprised you about getting to where you are? Um, and we could start off with Morgan. Sure. So one thing that's that's surprised me throughout my career so far is how much there is to learn and take away from situations that on paper might not seem like they hold all that much value. Um, I've been in some fairly toxic work situations in the past. Um, and, you know, when you're in that kind of situation, the first priority is always to get out of it when you have the means to. Um, but coming away from those situations, I was surprised at how much there was to, to take away from that and to apply to my, my next search and, and in defining what I want in my career and, um, you know, what I want the environment that I'm in to look like. Um, so whether you're in a, you know, a great culture where you're really happy or, or in a not so great one, um, you know, there's a lot to be gained by paying really close attention to your environment. You know, what about it feels toxic? What about it feels supportive to you? Um, and really analyze and commit those things to memory so that you, you know what to look for and what to look out for in the future. Um, and this goes not, not just for your working environment too, but um, you know, in the culture, but, but the tech and the, the nature of your work too, you know, if there's something that you really don't like about a particular programming language, you know, maybe you find that you, you really don't like JavaScript because it's weakly typed, right? Or you, you don't like the way that your company does development. Um, you know, that's something that you, you don't want to take for granted that it'll always be that way. Uh, you know, there, you can, you can research and check it out and see, you know, is this the industry standard? Are there, alternatives that other companies are doing, um, you know, what other options might I have? So I think there's a lot to be learned when you kind of just take stock, pay attention to what's going on for you internally in the environment that you're in, um, and really notice and pay attention to what resonates with you and what feels fulfilling for you and what does not. Um, because at first blush, you know, it sometimes feels like there's not much of a benefit to a current situation. Um, but even if it's just that I never want to work with this technology or I, I, I never want to work in a culture like this again, um, you know, all of that is is really valuable for, uh, you know, has been valuable for me for sort of positioning for the future and sort of figuring out what your path will be. Definitely. Um, it's a lesson of, you know, having your past inform your future decisions. Um, one thing about JavaScript, though, like we're TypeScript's a great alternative. <laughs> so um, yeah. And um, so Kate, what has surprised you about getting to where you are now? Sure. Um, maybe less about getting where I am now as much as something I've been learning lately. Uh, but uh, I think especially when I was younger and I was self-teaching a lot and, you know, I even finally started going back to get my degree. I'm doing the computer science degree after the fact, but um, uh I, I kind of uh, learn. I've been learning recently that um, the tech the tech side is important, right? Like you know to to get to move up move up the ladder, get promoted, what have you. Um, obviously, technical ability is is very critical. Um, communication though is also perhaps equally important. Um, and I think I I always always knew to keep learning and going down that path on my own and and keep keep self teaching. Um, you know, I've got stacks of books all around the house, uh, but but it was always on the tech side. Um, so figuring out uh, how to communicate around technology, um, I think that always really surprised me um, recently is uh, how important that is. Yeah, for sure. Um, soft skills are definitely super important. Um, so I, my next question, um, so is what skills or learnings from your past roles have you have helped you excel currently? And uh, we could start with Alex. Awesome. Um, yeah, so to piggyback off of the idea of soft skills, I would not, not take that for granted. However, every single experience that I've had in my past has accumulated and added to what I do now. Uh, so I worked in a variety of fields um, throughout all my 20s. I was waitressing, bartending, catering. 
Um, I, I have some funny stories where I was in the middle of New York City and a jitter reader went out on me and I had to like go to Home Depot and fix it and I had like line of people. Um, I've had tents go flying off in a storm and car batteries die on me uh, during my job. I also work in an ocean logistics import company where I would get cussed out by a British sailor um, when a vessel wasn't making it on time. Uh, so what I would say is that I've dealt with a lot of pressure and unhappy people and done a lot of customer facing roles. And throughout all of that, there were uncontrollable uncontrollable factors. And uh, I, I think the most important thing is learning how to get through your challenges and persevere, persevere and persevere. Even if you don't know what you're doing now and how it's going to add up to your future, don't take it for granted. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, and I have Haley. Uh, would you like to share us uh, what previous uh, skills or learnings from previous roles uh, helped you currently? Yeah, um, I would say it's it's more of an inner journey than the, the roles themselves. But um, for me, I, I realize that I am someone who follows my instincts and they brought me to really good places. Um, the, the two things that I find myself doing more off, most often is just one being pretty relentlessly curious. So just trying to be that person to ask maybe the obvious and not so obvious questions, either from my own learning or um, to make sure that everyone in the room is really understanding each other. I think that's pretty beneficial. Um, just be, even if you're the one lone voice, do it. You're probably helping someone out more than you know. Um, and then just to take risks, really, um, and, and giving myself opportunities to surprise myself in what I think I, I, I can do or I'm capable of or even like. Um, for instance, I think management gets a really bad rap. I'm happy to talk about that further if anyone wants to talk about it. But um, for me, what I've learned about it is that I feel like people are like one of the most interesting, challenging puzzles to solve for. And when you're running a whole team, you have X number of variability between every single person. Every single person has their own motivations, et cetera. And so um, I, I would not, I couldn't have told you that's what I wanted to do five years ago, 10 years ago, but you know, here I am now and I'm loving it. So just again, take risks on yourself um, and, and follow that gut instinct somewhere. It's gonna, you're gonna learn something. Worst case, you learn something. Best case, you love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, so for our last question before we turn it over to the audience, um, are there any aspects of what you did to get to your current role that someone else can replicate to get to a similar position? Uh, let's start with Ali. Um, this is kind of a tough one to answer because it feels like it's very individual. It's a very multifaceted topic. Um, and I feel like it's very often wrapped up with like, how do I get to like your level? And I think it's incredibly important to know first that like titles aren't everything. Like they vary company to company and even person to person. Um, it can be frustrating if that's like your sole focus. Um, but that aside, like, curiosity, tenacity, and patience are absolutely key. Um, figure out how things work beyond just the surface level. Like, don't just learn the how, but the why. It is so incredibly important to understand why things are the way they are, what other things they're trying to solve for. You need like the full picture to really truly um, excel at something, I think. So like as much as you can, find opportunities that will give you the freedom to make mistakes under guidance and seek out people who answer your questions and engage your curiosity. Um, aim to be constantly improving. Like, especially in the tech space, things are constantly changing. There's no shortage of learning all of the pieces that complete the picture, whether it's purely technical, whether it's like all of the other aspects of the business that play in, um, or the experience that you're building for whatever or whoever your customer base is. So like truly, truly earning your seat at the table takes years and years of doing all of that. Um, it does take a lot of patience. It, it can have a lot of frustrations in there, but like everyone else has already said here, like all of that, contributes to your own growth. Um, like don't take any of that for granted, roll it all in there. Um, and so like, it, it does take time, but doing that will make you unstoppable. Definitely feels sort of like, a being, having a more of a growth mentality, uh, for sure, uh, would help you get there. Um, and the last, um, yeah, the last person I'll, I'll call on would be Morgan. Um, for the same question, which is anything someone else could do to replicate getting to where you are now? 
Yeah. So I would say learn what you like, um, learn what it is that's, that's important to you in a job. And when you have the opportunity to do so, be picky. Um, I figured out fairly early in my career that, that I wanted to be in a place that had strong engineering principles. Uh, and more specifically, I, I wanted to get more hands-on experience with writing tests. Um, so I made that a, a critical part of my next job search where I ended up here at Stavi. Um, and, you know, during my search, I was, I was picky. Um, I did my research, you know, I, I didn't apply to companies that I could discern had, had questionable or poor cultures, you know, looking at glass door reviews, indeed, um, blind, uh, you know, and just researching what the sort of sentiments are of, of people who, who are there. Um, in my interviews, I, I prioritized asking questions about those engineering principles and about testing. Um, I wasn't just guiding myself by, by what sounded good at the moment or, or who was going to pay me the most. I was, I was guiding myself through these elements that I had already decided that were important to me. Um, so just sort of having some vision for what it is you want to be doing. You, know, you don't have to have it all figured out by any means. Um, but if it's just a programming language that you want to work with or, or certain engineering practices that you want to get experience with, always have that in the forefront of your mind um, and be really picky about that. Uh, even before you apply, you know, really discriminate, does this organization meet these criteria for me? And don't be afraid to prioritize getting that information from your interviewers as well. Um, Cause you always want to remember you're, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And, and sometimes depending on the job market, even more so, um, you know, so having something tangible to set your sights on. And I think this also makes you more attractive to, to potential employers because it, you know, it shows that you're, you're passionate. It shows that you care about the work that you're doing. Um, you know, you're not just complacently showing up for a job. You have this thing that you want to be there for. Um, you're showing up because you want to work, you know, whether it's with that particular technology or that particular project management format, you know, you're showing that you will be present and, and you will care about the work that you're doing. Thanks, Morgan. Um... Okay, so we're going to go to our audience questions now. Uh, if you could, if anyone has questions, uh, please type it into the, the Q&A functionality in Zoom. Um, so we're gonna start now. Uh, funny enough, the first question is to me, um, which is how, how did you personally navigate your career change? Uh, it's bold and brave to do three career changes. Most people would have settled uh, by now, uh, by career two. Um, so I've always been interested in tech. I've, um, you know, I actually dropped out of CS on undergrad because it wasn't the most supportive environment. Um, so I've always kind of wanted to be where I am now. Um, when I was, um, when I was working in marketing, I did a lot of like VB, VBA programming just to make spreadsheets do what I wanted to do. Um, did a lot of freelancing. Uh, when I moved into education administration. Um, I worked with a lot of student data, so it's a lot of querying, it's a lot of report generation, data analysis, and then finally, by way of boot camp, like I got into software engineering, um, mostly specializing in the front end uh, right now. Um, but yeah, so it's just kind of always something I wanted to do, and I'm glad I landed here finally after like 15 years of just doing other stuff and trying to get in. Um, so yeah, that that's my that's my answer. Um, but moving on to our panelists, um, I have a question regarding uh, layoffs um, for our three Toast members, um, to Toast alums. Um, like, how did you handle the situation of being laid off? I can yeah, I can jump in. The first thing is like deep breaths and be kind to yourself. Um, it's it, they say there's two types of people in tech, people who have been laid off and people who have not been laid off yet. Um, it happens to almost everyone. Um, it's it's frustrating. It's disheartening. Um, I think it's especially frustrating when the company tries to build the sort of familial culture, because then when you're laid off, you sort of feel um, cast out of that. And I saw a lot of that um, with some other folks in the in the twist layoffs. Um, and uh, the second thing is to do your homework. Um, you know, things like severance are negotiable. Make sure you're you understand what you're signing before you sign it, um, and and understand you know and, and consult with outside folks as you can, because um, uh, there there is uh, so there's a lot of sort of technicalities, um, and making sure you really understand uh, 
the documents you're signing and things like that. Um, and it's okay to say, you know, I need an extra couple of days to review this. Um, I'm going to, you know, get back to you by Friday. Uh, so, so, um, just, just, but mostly, uh, be kind to yourself in the process. It is, it's always frustrating, you know, um, but, but, uh, that, that's, I think the most important thing. Thanks, Kate. Um, Alex or Ali, I don't know if you want to add anything to it. Um, sure. So I, I think it's really dependent on what situation you're in. Completely agree with Kate to be kind to yourself. Um, it's a difficult situation to be in regardless of what, how long you've been in the industry for. Um, I would say is definitely, if you can, do take the time to take care of yourself. Uh, you're number one, right? Take care of your mental health. Know that it's not a reflection of you and your abilities, but it is just circumstance and business. So it is not personal. Um, I would say also, if you have the time and capabilities, it's a great time to upskill yourself, right? So when you get yourself kind of recomposed and ready to get yourself out there again, uh, there's a lot of free courses out there where you can upskill yourself. And so, you know, use your time wisely. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so you got muted, Anne. I muted myself. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so the next question, um, it, it's going to, I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, the first one, and it's directed to Kaylee. Um, the first one, it, it says, I'm not familiar with a QA engineer role. What does QA do? And Kaylee, what drew you to become the QA, uh, become a QA engineer? Um, this hun hunting down inefficiencies tendency? These are great questions. And then I just also want to um, throw out there that it's funny that even on this panel that it's many of us actually came from a QA place and it was a stepping off point for ourselves. So you know someone who wants to get in in the industry or you yourself want to get in, I think it's something you should look into. Um, it's an interesting role because it's not something you really go to school for. It's not even something you really learn about until you learn about companies and software development teams and all the, all the pieces involved. Um, I'm going to use an analogy for QA because as Ali said earlier, you know, titles are meant to mean something, but a different team, a different organizations, they, what is expected out of the role can be different from each other. And so you can see the same exact title. One company would expect one thing out of you and another company would expect a different thing. So here's my expectation. Uh, based on my experience. So imagine software is like building a house. And when you build a house, you have all of these specialties that need to be involved in the project. You have the plumbers, you have your tile guy, you have carpenters, um, you have a safety inspector at some point to come in and say like, yep, this looks good. And then you have a general contractor, contractor kind of has a, having eyes on everything and running the entire show. If I were to ask you what you think the QA role is, most people would say it's the safety inspector and I would disagree. It's actually the general contractor. You want to know what exactly you're building, who everybody involved is in it and what are they doing? Do they up to spec to your, you know, ability, like to your view or not? And to question, you know, hey, are we doing the right thing? And is this the right cadence? And are we doing this with the customer in mind? Or just et cetera. So um, it can be a very powerful role for a software engineering team where developers can focus really, really narrowly on writing code, which is great because they're making all the micro decisions on how is this going to work, short-term, long-term, longevity, scalability, et cetera. Someone in QA has to know the feature really well inside and out, but also have that broad perspective of how does this thing we're doing fit within the broader product and the organization as a whole. So that's my spiel on QA. It's a great uh, role to start in and, and also stay. And I have friends who are still in it and will probably be in QA their, their entire careers. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of stick around the QA question, I do have another quick QA question and someone else could answer this. Um, this is uh, for, uh, this question is, I have years of dev and product experience and have been partial uh, QA for a long time. I just now am finally full-time QA. I'm surprised by how QA is looked down upon or treated as an obstacle often. Is this a typical culture across tech or is it possibly the team or company that I'm in at the moment? any former QA folks want to answer? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, it is, a, it, it, there's always going to be a little bit of friction because developers want to get their features out and QA often are the ones saying, hey, 
no, you have to fix this thing. Uh, and in good organizations, I think Toast had a, had a pretty solid um, team for the most part. And so, so good organizations, they, they learn how to partner well and they have, you know, QA on each team and they work with them and, you know, uh, can, can help retest and things like that and um, have clear expectations going into it. Because, you know, there's times when I found something that there wasn't, wasn't clear expectations for. Um, so, so I think there can be a really strong culture around QA. Um, and I, I, I don't want, I don't want to say there's always friction as in is always challenging. Um, but, but in the same way, and I actually feel this similarly with security, right? Cause sometimes as security, I have to say, no, here's how we're doing things. Uh, and, um, it's, it's just the, the goals of that role. The goal of QA is to make sure the product is good. Um, so, so. Uh, there, there are good organizations out there, um, and it is, it is always really disappointing when QA is looked down upon. Um, but I, I, and I think it's worth finding a, a role that a, a company that really does value QA. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So the next question, uh, is I have an education in liberal arts as many of the panelists here do as well. Uh, I feel that many engineering managers want to see CS degrees on a resume to hire or to get a promotion. How did you navigate in this in your career without one? Any takers? We could, I could call on Ali. I just, sorry, I got distracted and blanked on the, can you repeat the last part of that? Sure. Question? <laughs> um, uh, so this person, um, is, has an education in liberal arts, and they feel that many engineering managers want to see CS degrees on the resume to hire or to, to promote. How did you navigate this without a CS degree? Um, so if I'm being totally honest, when I'm looking, like when I'm interviewing people, I very often don't even look. Um, I, like I'll glance at it, but it does, I want to see what you can do. Um, I think a lot of this is the a, a product of the culture of the company that you're at. So many people come to this field being self-taught um, and are just as capable. Um, I, I by no means like degrees are great. They add a ton of um, just other experience that I don't, it doesn't even necessarily be a relevant, need to be a relevant degree. Just like the process of going through to get a degree tells me a lot about people um, in terms of like, you know, you, you set out to do something, you completed a goal, if nothing else, like it tells me that about you. So it, it's a lot of insight there. Um, if you, in my opinion, if you find a company that doesn't want to hire you because you don't have a degree, there's something that's going to be missing from the culture that you're not going to get because they're expecting a lot of the time too, probably that you, you know, you have all these things coming out of the gate. Um, if you want an, a, a place that's going to foster really like curiosity then that's really just going to be a secondary thing um, that doesn't matter as much. So um, I, I don't know if that really answers the question, but like for me, I, I feel like I found those companies that didn't necessarily care that the degree I had wasn't relevant. Um, and, and, you know, was looking at the skills that I was presenting to them from what I had learned and, and taking that um, into very heavy consideration, um, which I'm very grateful for. I know it's not common, but um, yeah. look for that for sure. Yeah, um, and I could add something to that also yeah. on the other side of the fence of being a hiring manager. Um, I too don't really take a lot of stock into that line item for, you know, what, what education looks like. Um, so doubling down on just what Ali was saying, you know, it's about the organization and who in the organization, you know, who are, who are the people on the ground actually running it and what, what are their perspectives. Um, but if you are making the shift and you feel like there's a gap there, I think you can promote yourself in a different way. Like we've talked about the soft skills being so key. I think that's what makes actually um, people who have shifted careers later in life into technology really powerful because they they have already figured out how to communicate in a professional way and an effective way with anyone usually, right? Different organization, different people. Um, so one anecdote I can give you is someone I hired at my last job was someone who used to make prosthetics, went to school for prosthetics, thought he'd love it. He hated it. So he took a, he quit a job, took a coding academy, and then he was also just furiously looking for some organization to land in. And his strategy was to actually start talking to folks on LinkedIn. And I was so impressed by his proactiveness and his communication that it opened a door to say, you know, 
I don't know if our organization really can take on someone who's so junior, but let's just have a conversation, initial conversation. It goes amazing. Okay, let's uh, let's go through an actual interview panel. Okay, so he's definitely confident. Can we can we as an organization support him? And we decide yes, we can. And so we ended up hiring someone we didn't intend to hire because of his approach and just him being able to really talk about himself in this way that really connected with us. Yeah. Adding on to that, don't forget, don't hesitate to apply anyway. Um, I, I have worked at a company that said degree required. I don't have a degree. Uh, so, so, and, and there's some statistics out there I'm going to totally butcher, but like how women apply to, they feel like they need to check all the boxes. Um, like I I've worked at a place that says degree required. It wasn't required. So don't, don't hesitate to apply anyway. Yeah, for sure. Don't let let the company be the one to uh, remove you from consideration. Don't remove yourself from consideration. Um, OK, so our next question is, is a little bit broader. Um, so what's your biggest challenge in your career so far? Um, any takers or I could start calling on folks. Let's let's hear from Morgan. <laughs> Yeah, so and I, I had I had seen a comment uh a little bit ago to to this effect too. <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge that I've had is um my own perfectionism. Uh one of the most important things that I've learned is perfect is the enemy of, of good. Um and perfect very rarely or probably never really exists. Um and you have to remember that um you know working in this field is a constant learning process it's a constant learning process and you're constantly growing and there's constantly going to be things that you don't know or that you're going to trip over or um you know that you you struggle with and you're going to need help with and and that is so okay it's so okay to not be perfect and to to make mistakes and to um you know to reach out for help in those situations when you need it and it's really important to i think um internalize that and and not hold yourself to a standard that's not realistic um because sometimes what you'll find is that you're you're holding yourself to a standard that other people are not um and and we're 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 very often our, our own worst critics um so you know i think yeah just just navigating having that sort of perfectionism is it's definitely a challenge thanks morgan um okay so the next question i have was is uh what would you say was or were the most helpful things to transition from to tech from a non-traditional non-tech background i can answer that um so some Something I think is incredibly helpful within the interviewing process when you come from a background that doesn't relate to tech, be very specific in the companies that you're applying to and try to find a connecting factor with something that you've done previously to that company. So I'll give you an example with Toast, for instance, I came from the service industry um, that made it highly relatable. So it's like, oh, okay, this person, they understand our customer base. It makes sense for them to work with us. So try to find that relatable factor. Um, that, that would be my number one thing is, is really try to focus and narrow down and find that relatable item. Thanks. Um, so anyone else want to take a stab at that or we can move on to the next question? Yeah, um, I, can, um, I can cover a couple things. It took me a long time. Um, and I think that it isn't very often talked about, like it took me, um, I want to say eight months of applying to places once I decided I wanted to be in tech and I had been self-teaching for a long time before that. Um, and, and it was really frustrating. Um, so, so again, being kind to yourself in that process, um, and then, you know, also being willing to take a role that, that gets your foot in the door, um, you know, and, and because because all of where I started was in this role that's sort of support-ish. I don't know if it's complicated. You can see it on my LinkedIn. But uh, be, being willing to take something that gets your foot in the door and gets you involved. And then, you know, when I was like, hey, I want to move to QA, that was a, a lot more organic transition. Um, so so uh, I, I think finding finding the opportunities. And the last thing is, uh, you know, going to, going to conferences, going to meetups, 
meeting people, talking to people, getting involved. Um, I, I'll, I'll cite an example. Um, I, I helped run uh, DevOps Days Boston, and we were desperate for volunteers, and we really got to know our volunteers, right? Like, and and we really needed people to help set up some stuff, and and then we get to know these people, um, and they don't have to be involved in DevOps yet. Um, so so you know, but then we get to know these people after the fact and build these really solid friendships, and now I have a person in mind who's like, oh, if I cease an opportunity for that person, you know, I'll reach out. So um, these conferences and and getting to know people and and raising your hand and say, hey, yes, I will volunteer to move chairs. <laughs> uh, so, you know, or, or whatever it is, um, meeting people and, and making those connections is really important. Awesome. Um, all right. So moving on to our next question. Um, so how do you know when you're ready for more responsibility in your role? You can't always be 100% sure, but how do you know if it's just nerves and is not just not a mistake? I would say if it's a mistake, okay, right? Like if you if you say yes to something that's not a good fit for you, then my expectation is that you're at an organization where you can talk to your manager about that and say, hey, I tried it, not for me, and, and push that somewhere else. And if that's not possible, then I would argue it's probably not the right organization for you. But like you can't learn without taking risk. Um, to be more specific about the question, I think if you have a sense that you're feeling very comfortable and kind of bored, <laughs> that's a good signal that you need something new. Um, not to knock feeling comfortable. I think there's a place and time where you know you want your work to be very stable. Um, but check in with yourself about how you're feeling. Are you learning something new? Are you growing? And if you're not, is that something you want to take on now? Yes or no? Regardless of what the responsibility is and how far away you think you might be from it. Um, but starting to put it out there that you're interested, uh, might you might get opportunities your way that maybe are like a little bit lower risk. So for instance, you know, when I took on management, I didn't really know if I wanted it. And so we did like a trial period of like, okay, well, we have this open rec here. Why don't you start here with this one person and see how you like it? Um, and that's not something I would have come up with. That's something that someone else took my situation and, and offered to me. So being transparent about how you're feeling, even if you don't have a solution in mind, might get you to somewhere interesting if you start to open up about it. For sure. Did anyone else have a answer to that question? Um, I absolutely agree with all of that. I also think a lot of the time you kind of just naturally, if you are that type of like very curious person, you kind of start leaning that way when you're ready for it, regardless of whether you're conscious that you're doing it. Um, so definitely be aware of the things that you're doing. Um, even if it's something that you're like, oh, like that, that was new. That was kind of cool. I want to I keep doing some more of that. Like, um, I, I think it, it's a very natural progression as we, um, mature and like just professionally and as people, um, that you start leading that way. Um, so pay attention to that. Okay. Thanks, Ellie. Any, any other takers? We might be moving uh, on to our last question soon. Um, okay, so our last question is, uh, what difficulties, if any, have you had to overcome as a woman working in tech? You know it's gonna come up, so. Alex, I'll go first and then um, think. Okay. Um... So I, I think we've all experienced this where um, just getting heard sometimes it's, it's difficult, right? Where uh, I might say something and then someone else in the same meeting will say the same exact thing. And it's kind of like okay, that, what I said wasn't acknowledged, but then what the guy in the room said was acknowledged. Uh, so sometimes having to navigate that is a little bit frustrating and difficult. And in those instances, what I try to do, depending on the meeting, um, and it, it does depend on setting and who I know, but sometimes I, I'll take a moment to pause what's going on, or I try to, and just ask if what I said is unclear. Um, I think of other scenarios. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it, I think it, it's uncomfortable to do it, but practicing, practicing pausing the meeting or practicing interrupting, uh, practicing, talking to your colleague that might have said something that was, that didn't resonate. So I had someone introduce me 
um, based on not my skills. <laughs> and that was very, uh, it, it, it just, it didn't feel good. Uh, so practicing tough conversations, I think it is really important as a woman. I think someone else had wanted to chime in. I think um, so. I say, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <You're good. laughs> um, Everybody has something to say. <laughs> Yeah, I I feel like I'm I've never really been like a you know particularly like girly girl or anything like I've always kind of my dad was very good at, at like teaching me like it doesn't matter like you can do everything that the boys can do which I'm very thankful for, and I think a huge part of it is also like the culture of the companies that I've ended up at I've been very very lucky, um, but to some extent like you also just need to like speak with as much conviction as you have all the time, um, that when I started realizing that I could do that and people stopped questioning as much that was like a game changer for me it was like oh the things I'm saying make sense and people are realizing that um definitely a, a, a not a universal thing because I think it's tough if you're if you're in places that just don't support that type of you know that have a more toxic culture it's tough um but do do you thanks Ellie and Kate I think I have run into uh questioning whether or not it's because I am a woman or because, you know, I think it sort of already came up. QA sometimes is looked down on. And since I was the only one of both, it's like, which one is it? Or or neither. And they just don't like me. <laughs> uh, and and the answer to that I've gotten from mentors is, is just focusing on the behavior. It doesn't have to be about either, uh, but saying, hey, what you said is not okay. Um, and it doesn't have to be because, I, because you said it to me because I am a woman. It, it's because because of the behavior versus the reasoning behind it and focusing on that uh, behavior and then impact. Yeah, for sure. I think Morgan, did you want to say something? Sure, yeah. So I, I've been pretty fortunate um, in my professional career and I, I haven't run into a, a lot of situations that, um, you know, especially have been, you know, cut and dry, uh, you know, being treated differently because of my gender, but, um, it was particularly bad for me in in school. Um, so I, I would I would say to to anybody that is still in school and, and is, is struggling with that find a you know and, and I think this applies professionally too you know find a find a mentor um, find somebody who you can you know talk to about these things and um, your thought processes and, and isn't gonna gaslight you or, or, or tell you that um, you know, you're, you're thinking of things wrong or, you know, having those resources, um, I think is, is really important. Other people to bounce things off of and, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And Kaylee, want to close this out? Sure. Um, I, I too feel like I've been pretty fortunate with who I've been able to work with and the environment there, but I've been the only woman in a room many, many times over. Um, so I think my best advice here is to hold people accountable, right? If you see behavior that you don't think is acceptable, you have to do something about it. Don't just sit there and eat it and assume that you deserve it or it's okay. It's not, it's usually not okay. So you use the resources within the company to make sure it's known and that action is taken. If you feel like you can't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation first, and ultimately if the organization too sort of fails you, get out of there. Yep, for sure. All right. Um, so. I really want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this lunch hour. It's been great. I've learned a lot about my colleagues. Um, and thank you for Women Who Codes for, for hosting us. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you from Women Who Code um, to all the amazing panelists and to Anne. You are an amazing moderator. And I also want to thank the participants who gave amazing questions, many of which we could not get to. So I just wanted to share that Women Who Code has copy and pasted all of these questions and these will absolutely help us plan future events, know what you're looking for. Um, so definitely go to our website and join the community so that you can keep up to date because we are taking your feedback and, and we'll do something with it. So thank you so much and thank you everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.